Well, I'm really happy to uh, introduce you, but uh, again, <laughs> you all know her, Professor Anne Stickelboot uh, from Leiden University Medical Center. Um, Anne is going to present us uh, an overview of the shared decision-making works in uh, the Netherlands with a special focus on uh, uh, the relation between research and public health policies, knowing that this morning the plenary session is dedicated to the focus on public health issues and the relation that we can make between how it works, how research field, and how to implement uh, uh, our outcomes. So we thought it was a really a great uh, example uh, to present you uh, how they are how they did and how they do uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and after, you will have uh, the French side, and then uh, we will be able to uh, listen to Jocelyne Demer, who is a patient representative. So thank you, Anne. Thank you, Nora, for this kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me. Oh, does the, I don't know if they do that. I just put mine up. Maybe someone upstairs is doing it as well. <laughs> Um, what she didn't tell you is that I took over from Trudy van der Weyden, who's much in a better position to talk about this topic. Um, and to be honest, it's not about public health policy, because in the Netherlands, and that's not what I understood, and in the Netherlands, public health policy is something different. So I'm talking about policy at different levels. You'll notice later on. Um, I'd rather stand there if you don't if that's okay for the people in the front rows, because my shoes on that wooden floor, is this okay for <laughs> the people up here? Um, and Trudy is arriving, she had a family happy thing yesterday, a ceremony, so she couldn't come. Um, she graciously asked me and Nora thought that was a good idea, so I hope you can stick with me. <laughs> and um, so we talked about this together. I, I put it together with the help of Trudy. And so it's about implementation, and that's Trudy's thing. She changed her chair even from uh, implementation of guidelines to implementation of shared decision making. And um, we owe a lot, I think, to the ISDM 2011 that she organized in Maastricht, and I'll tell you about that. And after two days of this conference, I have started to think that, in fact, where I thought we were really slow, we, we seem to be a best practice maybe together with magic. So I'll tell you something about our best practice. So this all started at Maastricht, Trudy's meeting, for those who know her. Um, and the special issue, have we gotten it yet? The, the update of the Zeitrief für Evidence, etc., the German Evidence-Based Medicine Journal, will come today. But this was the 2011 Maastricht special issue where um, there wasn't much. <laughs> Um, there were 16 patient decision aids, there wasn't much policy, there wasn't much buzz around it, um, limited interest. The patient movement in the Netherlands uh, was strong already at that time. There were a lot of patients at the meeting also, but not in shared decision, make, shared decision making yet. For my talk, I need to tell you a little bit about the Dutch system, because the system impacts much, I think, the way SDM is implemented. Um, since 2006, we have an inclusive semi-market health insurance where it's regulated competition between the not-for-profit, but they, they make a lot of profit, but they're not-for-profit, so it doesn't go to their board members a little bit, but it shouldn't, <laughs> um, and, and between the hospitals. Um, but they mandatorily have to accept uh, patients for a basic package, and they can compete with the add-ons. Um, we have free choice of health insurance, but people don't switch a lot. Yearly, pe around tw 10 to 20 percent of people switch. Um, and we have a free choice of general practitioners, but the general practitioners are really a gatekeeper to secondary care. And some of the specialists, particularly in the university medical centers, but more and more in the, in the peripheral hospitals as well, as well um, are uh, employers, um, employees, sorry, and some are group practices where they sort of have a fee for service payment. Oh, this is funny. I didn't see the lines on my sheet. Um, at that time, there wasn't a lot. I just wanted to show you two slides from our own research. Here's Marlene Kuhneman's um, PhD thesis. And we saw that she called it reasons for encounter. The red light should go on. Oh, here. 70% 
only, um, well, oncologists gave a reason for the encounter, but only in three out of a hundred it was to make a decision. <laughs> and no one of these oncologists and breast cancer, uh, rectal cancer patients, sorry, this is radiotherapist, next one is oncologist. No one provided more than the option of radiotherapy. So the option of no treatment was just not discussed, even though it's a viable option. Median option score, really low. Another thing that we studied was implicit normativity. That's a bit my hobby. Doctor steering patients toward the, patient, the treatment they think is best. I mean, out of benevolence, of course. But also for preference sensitive decisions. And Engel, Engelhardt, another student of mine, studied this in medical oncology with breast cancer. Um, these are really uh, steering behaviors, steering patients towards a decision. And if you say, we recommend, that's really strongly pervasive, persuasive to patients. Sh do you want to start today or next week? So you're going to start, but when do you want to start? <laughs> uh, the side effects are not that bad. And the most important one, deciding about treatment before you've presented the side effects. So we're going to give you chemotherapy, now I'm going to tell you about the side effects. Or the nurse will tell you. So there's no trade-off in the, in the encounter. Okay, what did Trudy say then? What does the future look like? We need a lot of concerted action. Education, patient empowerment, patient decision aids. There was a lot of talk about patient decision aids. Um, and supporting professionals, well, all these things you've been seeing yesterday and uh, on Sunday. We had a Dutch platform, which started mostly with the researchers. They started at a conference, of course, there were researchers, but it grew with, with implementation people, with a lot of nurses, not so many clinicians, but it worked, I think. A national platform. We're a small country, so that's easy in the Netherlands. So what happened since? Still, it was quite slow. There was increased awareness due to the meeting, but there was somewhat more teaching. Our group, Trudy's group, not that many groups, some groups that saw this from the platform. Little implementation, like everywhere, a lot of research on patient decision aids. More information on the internet, but not enough. And some interest by projects from health insurance companies. A lot of research, notably on oncology. But then, I think this was a major trigger. I cannot prove this, but this is my, my sense. Our Minister of Health wrote a letter to Parliament. This was October, you can't read it, probably 29th of October 2015, called Deciding Together. And I think this helped really, together with the health insurance and the doctors, to push it forward. She's a very liberal, uh, liberal, uh, right-wing liberal in the Netherlands uh, minister. Um, so she's against non-smoking programs uh, paid by the government and things like that. <laughs> but this was a good thing she did. But I'm not sure about her motivation. She was strongly motivated, I think, by the practice variation research. Um, we had people who studied with Wenberg and came to the Netherlands and did the same stuff in the Netherlands, showing this practice variation and what we discussed yesterday, for these elective interventions, I think what she thought, she read the Cochrane decision aid papers, or her, her people did, and she decided, well, if we let patients choose, we'll save money. I think that was one of the backgrounds of her letter. But okay, it worked. I think it worked. The letter proposed the list of solutions. She wanted a stronger role for patients, and one thing that has is already in place is a new patient act. The perfect one is still coming, but as you can see, it's called about uh, quality complaints and disputes. So it's at the moment, it's still about giving patients more power in complaints and disputes. But nevertheless, patients are becoming more aware. So mandatory information from the healthcare insurance, from hospitals and providers, so for patient versions of guidelines, um, I was talking to someone here up here from uh, France who's working on that. Um, support for patient decision aids and 
reimbursement and experiment with end-of-life decisions for patient time, having longer consultations because, of course, if you have a long conversation and you don't replace the hip, you lose money as an orthopedic surgeon. But this was only for end-of-life decision making because at the same time there were lots of discussions about treatment at the end of life and we should stop giving chemotherapy all the way till the end. And e-health. And I really want to read to this to you. Our ambition is clear. We want patients, together with the doctors, to ultimately decide upon the treatment that fits their situation. I mean, this all fits our society here. All stakeholders in healthcare, I think she means should subscribe to this, because they don't yet, <laughs> and work hard to make this possible. It's clear that this will cost very much energy, time, money and effort, we all know. For if it were easy, we would have already reached our goal. I will facilitate this process and create sustainability by taking the lead. I mean, this is quite a strong statement. I know that I ask a lot of all parties and that they will need to do their utmost to reach these goals. I much appreciate that all parties in this process are ready to do so in the interest of the patient, who is entitled to clear, reliable information and an equal position in healthcare. Well, this is something, I think. So where are we now? This was 2015, and I think since then, I mean, it really became a buzz. And that's what Trudy said also in the, in the paper that you can read this afternoon. Shared decision-making, a buzzword, Trudy. And we got a major buy-in from a lot of important bodies, and that's, I think that's the thing we all need in our countries, to get buy-in from, in the first place, the medical specialists and the GPs. Um, I forgot the Primary Care Federation, those are two federations in the Netherlands, and the patients. And in the Netherlands we see those, these two working together now strongly. They, have, they had the Ask3 campaign, started two years ago in several hospitals. Um, they have a new campaign, Better Car Care, starts with a good conversation, with a website, with videos and everything. A website for patients and a website for doctors. I mean, it's open to everyone, but you can click either. Um, with good practices, a beautiful website, with tools. Um, consultation cards, uh, based on the option grids, and decision aids. The Netherlands Federation of University Medical Centers, where most but not all of the researchers are located, some are also at uh, other universities and um, peripheral hospitals. They have a big improvement cluster where shared decision making is one of the topics. Our Medical Research Council joined this. They are, they are paid by, uh, the money is funded through the government to this research council and through that to us. <laughs> Um, and they have a program, Quality of Care, with puts, which puts shared decision making in the foreground. And a large project, um, Beslist Samen, deciding together. Um, and Haske van Weenendaal, whose project leader is here in the audience, well, maybe not now, but is, are you here, so Haske? Oh, Haske is there. <laughs> it's 10 peripheral and two academic hospitals in this project doing campaigns in their hospital and using all the materials we have. And since we're a small country, that helps. Government advisory bodies, there's um, strong involvement in those advisory bodies that we have from researchers and clinicians, which also helps. And of course, the healthcare insurance companies who sort of compete. If, if one starts, the other think, oh, I should do this too, and the third one too. There's, there's six major ones, five or six in the Netherlands. So they clearly watch each other, and one starts, and they all want to follow. Mostly through decision aids, though, at the moment. There is also important attention to health literacy and numeracy, because that's a big thing in shared decision making that we don't discuss enough. I think I haven't seen many posters at the Society for Medical Decision Making, there's quite some research on that, but here I, I'm not sure I've seen a lot. Um, we have an institute because we have, we have a small population, 17 million, um, 1.3 million low literate, this is just literacy, and three out of 10 are low health literate. And even one in two have low, um, have difficulties managing health, chronic disease, etc. So these healthcare, in, um, and then we have our 
National Care Institute that develops guidelines is getting more the link between the guidelines and shared decision making. And we have some small enterprises who jumped in, who saw a business case here, for mostly for patient decision aids, and some of them, even um, Patient Plus, they have, I don't know how, what kind of business model they have, but they deliver them for free at the moment. <laughs> Um, so they support us researchers in developing decision aids, but also now they have strong links to hospitals that implement decision aids on their websites. So all these people in, in the last two years have got the idea that we should do this. So I think this, this is the best practice. I changed this slide last night. Um, and yeah, I've shown you a lot what helped. All these bodies, you should get them all involved. Um, and I think the major thing was the national policy with the Federation of Medical Specialists and the patients together were, were the major vehicle, but Dutch in the audience can contest this. <laughs> uh, I don't want to downplay our role, people in this audience, researchers working together with clinicians, but also teaching, um, going to quality advisory bodies, being on these organs. We as a researcher, as researchers can have a really a strong role. And training and educating, because some of us are really, my dean wants me just to write high impact factor papers and not do much more, a little bit of teaching, but I'm doing a lot of training and, and giving talks and that um, he doesn't want me to do, but I think this is really important. I think among you probably there's a lot of people like me who have this strong mission to improve healthcare. Patient organizations. We even have a few Dutch patient organization people in here. Are, are you there? Are you? Three, four. It's nice. They came all the way to Lyon. Um, and clinical champions. And those are really important. We have a small country. They are in the media. Um, and so we have increasing exposure in the media. And that really helps. Studies where doctors say, like Victor told me years ago, my consultations are so much more fun now, literally, surgeons saying that to me who were in one of Huska's projects. And the health insurance companies. It's still small, but it's growing. And this, of course, I mean, I can say all this because we are really 17 million and it takes you by car. I think this is the longest distance, it will be about three hours drive. This is where Trudy is. This should be Belgium, in fact. It's sort of sticking out. I don't know how we conquered this on the belts. The food is better. The people dress better in Limburg. It's, go to Maastricht and it doesn't feel like the Netherlands. <laughs> but these are the academic, the, the academic medical centers. But I should put some, here's a hospital, that, um, a un technical university that started doing this. And there's peripheral hospitals all over the place that are involved now, particularly with, uh, with Huskis program. But it really helped because national policy triggers down much more easy and a Dutch platform can eat meet. We always meet in Utrecht, you see, it's uh, one hour and a half, two hours for Trudy again. <laughs> and I think we're, we, one important thing that still needs to be done in the Netherlands and we're working on that. Um, and there will be more about this later from France. Because the guidelines and the multidisciplinary team meetings are really under the attention now as things hampering shared decision making. Um, they are strong because they provide quality and oncology has improved tremendously by the multidisciplinary teams and a lot of quality of care has increased due to guidelines. But we are now in a phase oh, where they hamper shared decision making. Um, so the research projects now in Leiden, in, in Maastricht, in some other situ situations, but also implementation using support software um, to support multidisciplinary teams, and particularly to have the result from a multidisciplinary team be options and not just one choice. Guidelines also, often there's not that strong evidence or strong evidence with trade-offs that we know are called preference-sensitive decisions. But then if you read the guidelines, the recommendations are quite strong. Patients still tokenistic in the guideline committees. So we're really working hard in changing this. 
I'm going to skip these two projects for the sake of time, because we started a bit late. Um, so this tension between guideline-driven care and shared decision-making, a lot of clinicians forget that the third pillar of evidence-based medicine is uh, patient preferences. So there's been recently, last week or two weeks ago, there was a, a report by one of those government advisory bodies published saying, without context, no evidence about the illusion of evidence-based practice. And when I first read the summary, I thought, oh no, we're going to back to the, the times without evidence. But no, that's not what they meant. They meant we really need to not be so strict with our guidelines, but take the context, the patient, into account. So I think this is going to be important, this, repro this report. So in conclusion, there's really a momentum at the moment in our country, but I believe in many of your countries as well. All together, that's the only way we're going to make it. Education, training, role models, we've seen a few sessions yesterday. It's so hard because we need so much training, but we have to do it. And development and implementation go hand in hand. Implementation research and implementation itself, quality of care methodology is important. And we need context-based medicine. So we have a strong momentum, but we still have some way to go. Culture, culture, culture. In many disciplines, we see the differences between medical specialties, and that's often a cultural thing. Skepticism still around. Um, or maybe people not understanding what it is. We need to empower both doctors and patients and family members, I forgot those. And we change the balance from procedures to talk to conversations. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Anne, for this great overview. It's uh, amazing, really challenging for all of us. <laughs> and uh, it gives us, I think, really incentives to go further, to go ahead. Uh, and with the acceleration since uh, two years ago, so for we are going to see with Joel in, uh, in France, but I guess you have uh, uh, questions and comments after this uh, presentation. Angela. Uh, shall I just shout? Oh, oh. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Um, and that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, my question is about, um, you put a lot of this sort of growth impetus down to the health minister. Um, You're totally right, I think. Um, fortunately, oh, she asked if the top-down approach wouldn't create antibodies from people who think there's so much coming from up, and particularly in the UK, people now are just busy with Brexit, but they have all these quality outcome parameters, uh, same in Ho Holland, all this registration f coming down upon them, um, creating a lot of frustration. That's very true for the Netherlands as well. Um, fortunately, I think that down, a lot of people are not aware of this letter. <laughs> I mean, the major bodies are aware of it, and they've picked up on it. But uh, I think most doctors wouldn't be aware, and I think, I don't know if many of the Dutch researchers who've seen this letter. Have, have all of you seen this letter? You have? Well, I, I'm sure not all have in the Netherlands. Um, 
the thing is, we we are in a in a phase where everybody is so fed up with all the registration and all the stuff that's put upon us, that we're going to take some of that away, I think. And this is a type of care that p doctors like. I think that helps. But maybe I'm overly optimistic. Um, this sounds like it's all fantastic already in the Netherlands. And believe me, until three days ago, I, I felt it wasn't. And when I started putting together these slides, I thought, well, it's not that bad. And after yesterday and the day before yesterday, I think, well, we're doing quite well. <laughs> so I'm maybe a little bit more skeptical than my slides seem to to do, but we have so many clinical champions now who like shared decision making and who tell their colleagues that it's okay um, and who don't want to just be busy with, with quality uh, measurement. Um, and yeah, it's not that letter maybe that helped, but it's the whole whole movement. Um, yeah, so I'm not recommending any just any minister to do this, but in the Netherlands it worked. But the most important is to get the the doctors and the patients and the, the money providers together, like we did in the Netherlands. Tripartite, we call it. <laughs> doctors, patients, and health insurers. It's a tripartite business. Do we have time for one more? Yes, uh, Paul. <laughs> can you shout? <laughs> I can repeat. Oh, you want to run? No, I'm going to give. lost my voice during dancing yesterday so <laughs> we have a very active health minister in Norway who has been promoting this for several years and I've been talking to him personally and I think one of the big problems still is there and that is that politicians and researchers and the health system underestimate the cost of doing the change because there's so much teaching and learning and training to do and they are competing with the costs for chemo and all the new and every time there is a new drug the papers are full of it and everyone wants maximum not optimum and that's a fight I think we will never be able to stop so we will just have to work hard to convince them that this is uh, it, it's costly for about 20 years while we are changing and then it will be better. You're totally right and that's something I didn't put in our slides. It's going to cost a generation and talk to Jürgen Kasper. I don't, won't tell you the amount of money but he's changing the culture in the next years. Are you here Jürgen? Um, in just one hospital in Kiel. So in Germany there's a momentum as well apparently. Um, we, in the Netherlands also, one of the lucks is that this started at the same time as the whole end-of-life decision-making discussions. We shouldn't treat patients for quality of life, not for costs, for quality of life. You know, we are the country of the euthanasia and, and the, the living wills, and so we, we can discuss with patients that they shouldn't accept chemotherapy till the moment they die. That's one thing. We have big debates about costly medicines, not so much the chemo, but all the immuno stuff, all the MAPs. Uh, infliximab and for rheumatology and for cancer and other diseases um, and we realize and there's a lot of debate about that as well um, which helps I mean patients still want it and there's still stories in the paper about little boys having no quality of life because they didn't get their pompous disease um, treatment but there's debate now and the minister goes to talk to health um, to pharma pharmaceutical companies because we pay so much more than for example Turkey and it's just negotiations they know that we can pay it so they charge us more for those medications so there's there's a bit big push on pharma now to, to lower their prices so I think the public realizes also that we can't put just the money in in those things at the same time that we don't have enough money for nursing homes so that's something that that really helped in the Netherlands also I think but it's, it's really an important addition. It, this costs really a lot of money, just training a generation of doctors.
Now we are pleased to welcome Joël André Vert, who is a project manager since the 2000s at the National Health Authority in France. And she is um, widely engaged in clinical practice guidelines, especially on autism, but also she uh, managed a group on shared decision making, which starts in 2005. Maybe you speak a little bit about this uh, group and the objectives. Uh, so thank you very much to, to be with us today, Joël.